You know, uh, it's surprising, isn't it, what uh, God does with your life. I never expected to really be doing what I'm doing. Um, a few years ago, three years ago, when I handed uh, the... Oh, I know what this is for. It's to hang your glasses on. Yeah. No, nah, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, when I handed the church over three years ago, um, I, I really thought that I'd be coasting a bit. Uh, that was kind of my plan. I thought I've worked pretty hard for nearly 30 years and uh, I'm going to sort of just coast a little bit. Uh, Pastor Trevor spoke to me and said, I'd like you to take over the leadership of the movement. He said, it's not hard. You don't have to, you don't have to do much. All you've got to do is show up. And I thought, Trevor, you've got to know something. If I, if I take the leadership of this thing, I'm going to build it. I'm a builder. I can't help myself. And so the last three years have been pretty busy, but I'm loving it. I, I feel like I'm in my sweet spot, to be honest. And uh, it's a real privilege that uh, God has given me at this time in our ministry. So I, I love what I'm doing, and I love life. Uh, I just bring apologies from my wife, Mandy, who's not with us today. She's actually on the staff at uh, Catalyst Church. Uh, they asked her to go back on staff this year when uh, one of the pastors resigned suddenly last Christmas and she's been in a kind of an interim role and looks like being in an interim role for a little bit longer yet. <laughs> but uh, that means that we don't always get the opportunity to travel together, which is disappointing for me and her, and that's uh, where she is today. So I just wanted you to know that. But I'm enjoying life. I, I've been married for 41, 42 years, uh, yeah. really enjoying every minute of my life. I'm enjoying my grandkids. Yeah. You know, this is one of the unexpected blessings when you get to my age. If uh, some of you younger folk are sitting there thinking, man, you know, I'm not looking forward to getting grey hair and looking like that old geezer up there, I just want to tell you that your grandkids are an unexpected blessing. Every time you turn around, they're fun. I, I, I put one of ours uh, to bed earlier this week. My daughter-in-law's been in India uh, on a mission trip and so uh, we sort of shared looking after the grandkids a little bit. And uh, I'm putting, um, um, I forget which one, I can't think of a name. I love my grandkids, I can't think of a name. <laughs> Evie. I'm putting Evie to bed. And uh, I said, Evie, you got so, this is a lovely bed you've got. You're a lucky girl, aren't you? She says, yes, Pop, but I'm a bit worried for when I get married. <laughs> I said, why? She said, there's no room in here for my husband. <laughs> Aren't they a scream? An absolute scream. Another time I was uh, putting my grandson to bed and uh, we were talking about the story of, of Lot, you know, how he had to suddenly uh, exit the city and uh, he had to take his wife and flee. And I said, but his wife turned around and she turned into salt. And Joey said to me, well, Pop, what happened to the flea? Yeah. <laughs> True. Amazing, isn't it? The stuff they say. Have you ever said anything that you wished you could take back? Yes. You know, like sometimes we open our mouth, we say something, and as soon as you've said it, like the words are going, and you're like this, you're, you're trying to grab them, but oh, they've gone. It's too late. They've gone. Uh, I say things from time to time that I wish I could take back. I wish I'd put my hand over my mouth instead of shooting off my mouth. Now, our mouth can be like a weapon when we shoot it off, and we can do a whole lot of damage to people. Uh, sometimes we can do a lot of collateral damage. You know, people just within the sound of our voice. Some of the things we say can really wreck people's lives. It's dangerous stuff. Our mouths are dangerous weapons that we have. Uh, you probably noticed too that sometimes when we shoot off our mouth, the ones that we shoot at the most are the ones we love. How crazy is that? You know, fathers shoot sons. Mothers shoot daughters. Um, siblings shoot siblings. Friends shoot friends. I mean, what is that all about? Why do we do that? We've got this weapon at our disposal, but so often we fail to control it. You know, we've got big mouths, that's the bottom line, and our tongues are out of control. Now, James says in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, 
He says, all kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. Quite a thought, isn't it? We can tame all these other things, but we can't tame the tongue. I discovered very early in life that I had a problem with my mouth. It didn't take me long to figure this out. I was only a little guy, but I thought, I have a problem with my mouth. Now, my grandmother was a typical German matriarch. Uh, She sat on the throne of the family. And uh, at all of our family gatherings, there was grandma at the centre. And everybody did what grandma said. You didn't mess with grandma. No, sir. Uh, She was firm and she was tough, but she was so sweet, so kind as well. It's like she had two faces, two lives. Problem I had was I could never pick which life she was living (laughs) at that particular moment. And I know that she was like this because, you know, even after all these years, she's been gone about 40 years. I still remember how scared I was of her, (laughs) but how much I loved her as well. My grandmother was absolutely everywhere. She was everywhere at all at once. She was omnipresent. (laughs) When I was a little guy... I didn't need a conscience. I had grandma. I didn't need God. I had grandma. Because she was everywhere. And every time I was tempted to step across the line, there was grandma. And she had this favorite saying. She'd say to me, Philip, put your hand over your mouth. Because I'd opened my mouth and I'd said something that I shouldn't say. I had this big mouth. And every time I opened it, grandma was there to hear what I said. She was definitely omnipresent. I mean, she would, she would appear out of walls. She'd come up out of the floor from behind a cupboard. Didn't matter where I was, every time I said the wrong thing, there was grandma. Philip, put your hand over your mouth, boy, she'd say to me. I must have been really ticked off with her one time because uh, I can remember going out of the house into the backyard and climbing up onto the top of the outhouse with my cousin Kay. And the whole purpose of this mission was to talk about grandma, (laughs) to talk about how mean and tough she was. Now, now, just let me draw the picture for you. My grandparents were very wealthy. They had a, uh, they owned a a great big uh, block of flats at Redcliffe, right on the beach. Uh, Three stories of flats, eight flats in all. And, uh, you know, this is 50, it's a lot of years ago anyway. Uh, And, you know, in those days, we didn't have the privilege of sitting on porcelain. We had to go down the backyard to the outhouse. But there were eight outhouses in a row, all joined together, you know, different compartments in a row. And there's this great tree hanging over the back of it, a mulberry tree it was actually, and we'd climb up this mulberry tree and get onto the roof of the outhouses. So we'd go up there as kids, grandkids, all together, and we'd sit up there and we'd play games up there when we were pirates and everything else like this. Well, this one time, uh, Grandma must have really ticked me up because Kay, my cousin Kay and I, who was always in trouble with me, uh, we climbed up onto the top of this roof. And uh, we're sitting up there and we're really talking about how mean and tough grandma is, when suddenly, I mean, right beside my ear, I hear this voice. So you think I'm tough and mean, do you, Philip? Put your hand over your mouth. (laughs) Now, can you imagine how traumatic that would be (laughs) for a five- or six-year-old boy? Just to sort of draw the picture a little bit better, these outhouses that you guys probably don't know anything about, they all had an air vent. Okay, you're getting the the picture? An air vent would go about so high above the the roof. So we're sitting on the roof, and my ear is right beside this air vent. And we were so engrossed in our own troubles and sharing our woes together that I hadn't noticed that Grandma had come up to use the outhouse. 
So our voice is traveling down the vent to her, and she took her opportunity <laughs> because she always took every opportunity to let us know how omnipresent she really was. <laughs> and then suddenly, that's how it happened, right beside my ear. How did she know that? It was uh, just one of those defining moments of my life. I was never more convinced in that moment of her omnipresence. <laughs> let me ask you a question. What's your favourite book of the Bible? Just let me know. What's your favourite book? Isaiah. Acts, Isaiah, Luke, John, Psalms, Galatians, Proverbs, Ephesians. Amazing. Every time I ask this question, nobody ever says Job. Nobody ever says Job is my favourite book. Job happens to be maybe not my favourite book, but high on the list. And I want to teach this morning out of the book of Job. I want to just talk about some things that Job said that he should never have said. Um, now, Job was a very wealthy, influential man in Israel, a leader he was, in actual fact, lived about, about the end of the second uh, millennium BC. And uh, through no fault of his own, the scripture tells us, he came into hard times. Some of us here this morning are in hard times. And Job was in hard times. And the question is, what do you say when you're in hard times? What kind of things do you say when times are not so good, when you're a bit challenged with life? Job came into these hard times, and uh, they were times like you and I will never experience. He loses his wealth. He uses his... Uh, his children, he, knew, he loses his health, uh, he loses so much, and then he shoots off his mouth. I wonder if you realise that every time you say something, God hears what we say. Every single word you say, God hears. You know, I'm old enough and wise enough and smart enough now to know that Grandma was never omnipresent. But God is. He sees everything, knows everything. He doesn't miss a thing. He doesn't miss a single word that you speak. Not a single word. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment. Listen to this. Listen to this. For every careless word that they have spoken... Every single careless word that you speak, you will have to give account for. It'll come back to bite you, what you say. And Job said some things that came back to bite him. In Job chapter 38, 2 and 3, it says, and this is God speaking to Job, okay? Now, you know, he'd gone through this long process of um, the devil dealing with him and trying to, to wreck him and trying to prove that you know, if everything was taken from Job, he would be like the rest of the people. So he's been through this long, difficult time that he didn't deserve to go through. And he said some things. He said a whole bunch of things. And now God speaks to Job at the end of this time and he says, Who is this that darkens my counsel? Who is this who speaks with words? Without knowledge, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. <laughs> I'm a big boy now. Um, I, could, I could cope. Yeah, I'm bigger. In, yeah. I could cope with my grandma saying things to me now. Yeah, I think I'd have a measure now. Well, I think I would. But the thought of having to answer to God for some of the things I said, quite frankly, scares me spitless. Really. And evidently, it scares the life out of Job also, because listen to what he says in Job 40, 2 through 4. This is what Job says. He says, I am unworthy. 
How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. He's finally learned. Wish I'd have learned when I was a little guy. Job says, I put my hand over my mouth. I've got nothing more to say. See, Job had experienced hard times. So what he has said has now come back to bite him. He wishes he'd never said it. And what is it that he had to say? What are some of the things that Job said during these difficult seasons that he was experiencing? Well, he said quite a bit, actually. And if you read through the book of Job, you'll, you'll pick them out. I'm going to deal with some of them this morning. We'll see how much time we've got. But we're going to deal with some of them. And see if you don't see yourself saying the same kind of thing from time to time when things are a little bit hard. See, God has been hurt by some of the things that Job has said. I don't think we always appreciate that. You know, we think we can say whatever we like, just like it is when we sometimes shoot off at the mouth to our friends, to family, to loved ones. Uh, we don't consider how that hurts them, but we know it does because that's life. We've lived enough life, all of us, to know that some of the things we say hurt people. Well, some of the things we say hurt God. See, God's got emotions. We, we don't see God like this. We see God as this white-haired old man in the sky who is somehow or other distant from all of us, emotionless almost. I think this is the concept we must have because we wouldn't say the things we say otherwise. But God is hurt by some of the things we say and he has been hurt by some of the things that Job has said to him. And now he's saying, well, Job, actually, what did you mean when you said that? How could you have said that to me, Job? Try and explain. Try and help me. Well, here's the first thing that I want to address. This is the first thing that Job said. It comes out of Job 3, verse 3. Job says, may the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said, a boy is born. What's Job saying? Job's saying, I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. I wonder if you've ever said that. I wonder if anybody here this morning is saying that. If you are, then put your hand over your mouth. Put your hand over your mouth. What a terrible, soul-destroying thing to say about yourself. You know, I've seen some stats in recent times that tell me that 30% of people consider killing themselves. Now, I don't want to make light of this. This is a very serious issue. And maybe somebody struggles with these kinds of thoughts here this morning. And if you do, you need to talk to somebody. Just share what you're feeling with somebody because there's a lot of help, a lot of help available. And uh, if you speak to somebody, you'll find out that some of those issues that are crowding in on you are probably not as great and not as overwhelming as you think they are. And so I really do encourage you to seek help if you are thinking like this. But, you know, to say, I wish I was dead. I wish I were dead. You know, what an insulting thing to say to the God who created us in his own image. Can you think how hurtful that is to the heart of God? It grieves his heart when we say that sort of thing. You're God's creation. You're his handiwork. You're his pride. You're his joy. You're the source of so much pleasure and then you say something like I wish I was dead you know I was looking at this uh, display of flowers here I don't know who put them together who arranged that but somebody has got some creative juices running in their being and they've done a pretty good job I would think if I went up to that person and said that is stupid what a waste of time you should just get them things and hoik them out into the Really, Ben, how hurtful would that be to the person who'd made that creation? I look around this auditorium and I can see that some care has been taken in presentation. Whoever's responsible for that, if I said, what a mess, you're wasting your time. It's just a tin shed you're trying to dress up. How hurtful. So put yourself in the place of God. I wish I were dead. How hurtful is that to God? You're God's creation. 
You're God's pleasure. And God loves us just so much. I, I think that you know, we, we begin to understand a little bit of, of what God uh, thinks of us when we read through all the scripture. I really haven't got the time to do that. So, um, but there are so many scriptures that tell us uh, how God looks at us and how God thinks about us. You know, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and what? Destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have life to the full, have abundant life. In fact, Jesus is saying, I want you to experience so much life that it kind of overflows. More life that you can hardly handle. We're supposed to be people of life. And in the name of Jesus, I speak life, life, life this morning over anybody who is struggling and thinking these terrible, hurtful things that could even end their own life. Life in the name of Jesus. If you've ever thought like that, if you've ever said that, put your hand over your mouth. Here's another thing that uh, Job said while he's experiencing tough times. This is uh, Job 3.25. He says, what I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. See, Job's saying, I knew this would happen to me. Yeah. Some of us have said that, haven't we? I knew this would happen to me. We say it, don't we? It's crazy. When hard times come, when we're in a season that we don't quite understand, I knew this would happen to me. Well, put your hand over your mouth. Don't say that. You know, Jesus actually tells us that uh, trouble's going to come. He says, in fact, you know, when trouble comes, he doesn't say, you know, trouble may come, if trouble comes. He says, when trouble comes. If you're alive and breathing this morning, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have seasons of trouble. And you know what? It's in the will of God for you to experience that. It's in the will of God for you to go through difficult times. Um, Jesus tells us that trouble will come. So in one respect, it's a fair thing to say, well, how did this come about? Or I knew this would happen to me. Um, but is it a pessimistic, fatalistic, I knew this would happen to me? You know, if you're saying that today, again, I say to you, put your hand over your mouth. You know, we all have certain fears. Job's fear was that he would lose his wealth. There is some power in our words, but I'm not real big on the power of negative confession wrecking your life because I happen to believe that God is bigger than the words that I speak. I happen to believe that God is more than able to overcome on our behalf. I believe that we don't have to live in faith, uh, are fearful of every word we say in case that brings some kind of curse on my life. I'm free from the curse. But I do believe that regular negative comment about your circumstances can create a mindset that sets you up for the very circumstances that you're afraid of. You, you can build an environment around your life that allows the thing you fear to happen. Um, we do have to be careful with our words. You know, one of the Proverbs says, the fears men have bring a, bring a snare. It's just come to my mind. I think it's about Proverbs 29. Um, so if you're saying... I knew this would happen. I knew this would happen to me. Put your hand over your mouth. Okay, the next thing that Job said when he came into these uh, hard times. Job 6, 24. Show me where I've been wrong. <laughs> Job's saying, what did I do wrong? Ever said that? Of course you have. I've said it. What did I do wrong? Put your hand over your mouth. You know, we all make mistakes. Nothing wrong with making a mistake and asking that question. Uh, you know, if you recognise your sinful nature and you're asking God to help you not to sin, nothing wrong with asking that question. But most times when we ask the question, it's, it's kind of the emphasis is on I, you know, poor me. What did I do wrong? Uh, it comes out of that poor me kind of attitude. Poor me, I didn't do anything to deserve this. Now, what's the reason for this? Well, you know, the Bible actually tells us that there are consequences for a lot of our doings, for a lot of the things we do. In fact, it says, you know, we reap what we sow, doesn't it? 
A lot of the circumstances we find ourselves in are because of our own wrongdoing, because of bad choices we've made, mistakes that we have made, and we reap what we sow. We shouldn't be asking questions like, what did I do wrong? Because sometimes we're entirely responsible for it. Um, but the scripture also tells me that it's quite possible that you find yourself in hard times. In fact, I know this to be true because Jesus says when trouble comes. Um, but it also says in Ecclesiastes that there are seasons of life. You know, a time to be born, a time to die. A time to build and a time to tear down. You know, there are seasons in life that are hard seasons. But the good thing about it is that the seasons come to an end. You know, time to be born, time to die. We hope it's in the opposite order. Uh, God is at work in our seasons because in uh, Ecclesiastes 3, I think about verse 11, it says, everything is beautiful in its time. Not at the end of its time. That means God is in the circumstances of your life. And we feel so isolated from God and we get into this poor me attitude when it's just a season of life that we're going through. And sometimes, you know, we're just wasting our time and our energy asking God, get me out of this because it's not going to end until that season is due to end. If you understand anything about seasons, let me tell you something. The season will end when it's time for the season to end. That's hard for us to handle sometimes. But it's the absolute truth. I hate winter with a passion. Nobody hates winter more than I do. But there's some really good news about winter. October comes. Winter ends when it's time for the season of winter to end. You get that? It's really important. It helps us to be able to cope with some of the things that we go through. There are seasons. And you know, sometimes we just need to talk ourselves out of the despair that we get ourselves in when we start to get this poor me kind of attitude. David was pretty good at that. He talked to himself quite a bit. Uh, Psalm 42, uh, verse 5, great example. Why are you downcast, O my soul? He's talking to himself. Put your hope in God, he says. He's speaking to himself. Philip, what's wrong with you? Why are you down in the dopes? Put your hope in God. And we need to talk to ourselves in these times and remind ourselves that God is in that season. He hasn't left us. He's walking with us in that season. But at the end of that season comes joy and peace. Tells us that in Galatians. If you've been saying, what did I do wrong? Just put your hand over your mouth. Stop saying it. You know, another thing that we often say when we're in hard times is, my days have no meaning. That's Job 7 verse 16. Job said it. My days have got no meaning. He's saying, my life is without purpose. Now, this should be really striking home because I've said all these things. You've said all these things. My life is without purpose. I have no purpose for living. You know, I've been in hard times and I've said exactly what Job has said. And you have too. In 1993, 94, our family laugh about it now, but we weren't laughing at the time. They were our years from hell. I made some bad choices in the church where I put wrong people in the wrong place. And as a result, we had two years of absolute hell. Uh, and I found myself just thinking it was all over. I'd missed my opportunity. My purpose in life, my sense of calling, was all down the gurgler because of these bad choices I'd made. But I discovered I just had to get over it. I really did. My family just wanted me to get over it. My son, who was 15, 16, 17, oh, what was he, about 18? Oh, I can't do the sums quickly enough. Um, he sent me a card in this time, in my darkest time. This is true. I've still got the card. It's in the front of my Bible. Um, you'd think he'd send me a card like, Dad, you're wonderful. 
you're marvelous. He sent me this card and it just said, get over it. And it really shook me up. I thought, I've got to get over it. I really got to get over it. That was a prophetic word from God. It really was. It shook me up, spoke to my heart, spoke to my spirit. And you know, today, uh, I live the most purposeful life imaginable. I really do. I, I am just so blessed. I feel so totally blessed for the privileges that I have right at this time in my life because I'm involved in kingdom enterprise. Amen. And every single one of us in this room is involved in, sing, in kingdom enterprise. Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled himself uh, through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I have a purpose. I have this incredible ministry called the ministry of reconciliation and every one of us in this room has that same mission has that same purpose in life. There's no way in the world we can say, my life is without purpose. No way. No way. Last Sunday, uh, my wife and I were sitting about where you're sitting, Kerry, uh, and sitting behind us was a young couple, and we were aware of them, and we thought, haven't seen them before. At the end of the service, we spoke to them, and they said, well, we've been coming for five weeks. Um, uh, the church has been doing a series on marriage and uh, somebody invited them. They'd been coming for five weeks and I said, wow, how did you find it? Oh, it's been wonderful. It's wonderful. It's given us so many answers. And it wasn't long before we worked out that this couple didn't know the Lord. And uh, in fact, they were living together. And so we spoke to them a bit longer and we led them to faith. And they accepted Jesus. Uh, on Monday, they rang the church office and they said, uh, can we speak to that nice elderly couple? <laughs> this is what they said. <laughs> and Nelly, I said, you go handle it. You go fix it. Now, I'm the president of A2A. I've got nothing to do with Catalyst Church, so you guys go work this out. No, I didn't do that, but that's what I felt like for, for a microsecond, only a microsecond, okay? All right? But that, that nice elderly couple, could, could I speak to them? Well, I was the only one there. And um, Tuesday, sorry, it was. And uh, so they, uh, they spoke to me and said, we want to get married. I said, why do you want to get married? Well, we were in the marriage series. We heard what they said. And we're Christians now, so we want to do what Christians do. And we were prepared to, you know, let that little season of grace run its course before we challenged them about that. So I've got the privilege of marrying them in about a month's time. Hey, kingdom business, the ministry of reconciliation. And somebody says, oh, yeah, but you're a pastor. Listen, that had nothing to do with me being a pastor, but everything to do with me being a Christian. Amen. And every one of us in this room has that same ministry, that same opportunity. Every single one of us. Don't ever say your life is without purpose. Don't ever say that. If you're saying something like that, put your hand over your mouth. Stop saying it. Stop saying it. This is a great church and you can bring people along here and they can uh, be um, confronted with the truths of the gospel in this place. Bring them along. Use those cards. What a great idea. What a great idea. Um, you've got to get that out to the movement. Um, um, you know, it's a great evangelistic tool, that. Non-threatening, non-confrontational. But the Spirit of God can use something like that. And you bring them into this house and you people love on them and you'll see that every one of you has a purpose. Every single one of us. You know, a life without hope is a hopeless life, isn't it? But the Christian life is filled with so much hope. It's so exciting. You know, in one of the darkest times in the history of the people of Israel, God, God told them something that gave them hope. And, and we love to quote these verses, but they have um, personal application as well as national application. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope 
and a future. Don't ever say my life has got no purpose. You said 11.30, didn't you? Yep. So if you're saying something like that, put your hand over your mouth. Next thing that Job said when he came to hard times was, I don't believe that he'd give me a hearing. You know what Job's actually saying? He's saying, God wouldn't listen to my prayers. Ever said that? God won't listen to my prayers. God's not listening to my prayers. You're going through a hard time. God's not listening to my prayers. Put your hand over your mouth. You know, God answers everybody else's prayers, but he's not answering mine. Now, when we're in hard times, it's so easy for us to feel like God isn't answering our prayers. I, I did a little uh, study uh, just last night, and I, I found six reasons, six clear reasons why God will not answer your prayers. They're the only six or the only reasons that I could find. There's probably a couple more, but uh, I don't think there'd be many more. Um, but here they are. I just want to read them off. If God is definitely not answering your prayers, these are the only reasons that I can find in Scripture that he won't answer your prayer. First of all, if you've got willful sin in your life. We've all got sin, right? Um, but willful sin is you know, being um, almost strategic about the way you go about sin. It's deliberately doing something that is contrary to the word of God. Willful sin. God won't listen to you. Uh, Isaiah 59 tells us that. Uh, unresolved marriage relationship. I'm not saying that there's a bit of tenseness in your relationship, but if there are unresolved issues that go on and on that you're not dealing with within your marriage relationship, God won't listen to your prayers. You'll find that in uh, 1 Peter 3. Uh, asking with wrong motives. <laughs> Isaiah 4, lack of compassion. If you are not a compassionate person, if you have no care, if you're not moved by the plight of the poor and those who are in desperate trouble, if that just doesn't affect you, well, then don't expect God to hear your prayers. You'll find that in Matthew uh, chapter 18 and Proverbs 21. Unforgiveness in your life. If you're harboring unforgiveness towards somebody, Matthew 5, Mark 11, and unbelief, a lack of trust in God. Six reasons why God will not answer your prayers. Willful sin in your life, unresolved marriage relationships, asking with wrong motives, lack of compassion, unforgiveness in your life, and unbelief. God desperately wants, well, you know, before I go on, the point is then get that sorted out. Get that sorted out. And uh, that's just an issue of repentance, uh, an issue of sitting down with a wife or a husband and talking through the issue and getting it sorted out in a biblical manner. I mean, you can sort those things out. It's not rocket science. It's not too hard. God desperately wants to, us to talk to him. And he wants us to talk to him in the hard times. And he wants to answer our prayers. But there are some conditions. You know, the Bible says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. See, God's not that far away. Then will I hear even from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And you can see four easy principles there in uh, getting reconnected with God. We must be followers of Christ. We must humble ourselves, put God first, resist sin, and stop doing it. You know, too many people seem to think that God is a, this nice old man, white-haired old man, who just wants to do everything we want to ask him to do. Well, God is good, and he does want to answer our prayers, but he will do that only out of relationship with us intimacy. See, God is a father God. God's heart towards us works like a father's heart towards his children. And he wants to do for us what is best for us. And when you understand that, and when you have that father, son, father, daughter intimacy with him, then you begin to understand a little better how prayer works. 
Don't blame God if your prayers are not being answered. You know, prayer is communicating with God. He wants to hear our hearts. He wants us to have conversations with him. Do you realize that prayer is really just a conversation that you're supposed to have with God? He wants us to speak to him. He wants us to speak to him like David used to speak to him. You read through the Psalms. If you want to know how to pray, read through the Psalms. It'll get rid of some of our crazy, stupid religious prayers. You know, Moses, uh, David would say, well, well, God, you know, the Philistines are coming and this is your reputation at stake, so kill them. <laughs> you know, your reputation's on the line. Kill them. Um, you know, David just spoke to a friend. And he wants us to speak to him like this. You know, sometimes I sit in prayer meetings and it just about tears my heart. Like, oh God, as I come into your holy presence today, I come in your... <laughs> and I have this picture of you know, God and Peter in heaven and they're looking at each other and Peter says, do you know what he's saying? And God says, well, not really. <laughs> And they go off and they do something else because they can't even understand what, well, it's not like that. But you're getting my point? He wants us to speak to him like a friend. And if we understand that God is our father, Abba Father, Daddy God, if we understand that, then we begin to pray differently and touch him in the way that uh, he wants us to be able to hear from him. Here's a good one. Uh, Job's in hard times. He says, I've become a laughing stock to my friends. Now, everyone's laughing at me. You're going through some tough times. One of the first thoughts you get is, everyone's laughing at me. Put your hand over your mouth if you're talking like that. It's a lot of nonsense. Get over yourself. You're not that important. Really. It's just not true. You know, Job had three friends, or four at the end. Elihu is a bit of a mystery. He kind of just appears. But apparently he was there all the time, but sitting a bit off in the distance. He wasn't in the inner circle, didn't feel that you know, he had the right to speak uh, when the other three did. But he had these four friends, and they had a lot to say. Some of it was good, some of it wasn't so good, but never once did they laugh at him. Yet Job says, everybody's laughing at me. Now, if we did an exercise this morning, if I said, if you're going through hard times and I ask you to stand, I'll guarantee not a single person in this room will laugh at you. Now, let's, let's tell ourselves the truth, then listen to the lie of the devil. People are not laughing at you. There's a heart of compassion in this place for you and the circumstances that you find yourself in. No one is laughing at you. No one. Now, who is so wise that they think that they can laugh at you? Anyone who laughs at you has got some sort of serious problem of their own, and all you've got to do is pray for them. Now, the Bible says that kind of laughter doesn't descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So they've got problems. Just pray for them. Don't feel sorry for yourself. They've got a problem. They need your prayer. Okay, here's the last one I'll deal with this morning. It comes out of Job 19, verse 4. Uh, Job says, My error remains my concern alone. He's like, Job's saying, It's my problem. This is my problem. It's not your problem. It's my problem. And if you're saying that kind of thing uh, when you're in hard times, then I want to say to you again this morning, put your hand over your mouth. Stop saying that. You know, when we're in hard times, one of the things that I've observed is this tendency to withdraw on the pretext that, you know, your problem is your problem alone and that you have to sort it out and I don't want to trouble you with my problems. How often do you hear somebody say that? I don't want to bother you with my problems. Um, you know what? Sounds honourable, but it's stupid. Nutty. 
crazy. See, it is not your problem. It is our problem. It really is. Now, I understand the difference between the kind of burden that you need to carry and deal with on your own. But Scripture says very clearly, Galatians 6 verse 2, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If you carry the problems that you have in hard times on your own, you'll be crushed, you'll fall down under the weight of them and you'll fall between the cracks. People say, this is my problem. I don't want to bother you with it. Withdraw. They disappear, fall through the cracks. And then one of the first things we hear is, nobody cares. And you just look people in the eye and said, back out. Leave me alone. I don't want you in my life because I've got a problem. It's crazy stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, it's an evil day straight from the pit of hell when you start to feel isolated and you feel it's your business and you've got to stand alone. The Bible tells us one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. You know, there's strength in numbers. United we stand, divided we fall, the saying goes. You know, I think of those scriptures uh, that speak about an evil day and I say to people, you know, who are going through difficult times, they say, well, this is my problem. And, you know, I understand there's balance in all of this. We can't all solve each other's problems, but we can, we can get around each other. We can encourage each other, can't we? We can do that. And when you're speaking to somebody's life and you say, well, you know, the end is better than the beginning. This isn't going to last forever. You give them hope. Um, you might not be able to solve the problem and pick them up and take them right out of the circumstances they're in, but they'll be strengthened because of the words of faith that you speak into their life. And, and I say to people in these circumstances, I, I think of that. Remember those? I mean, I, haven't, I think they might even be around. It's been reborn as a TV sort of show, but tag team wrestling? Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy stuff. I mean, it's all make-believe and they make out they're half-killing each other, but they're not. You know, they hardly touch each other. and It's just crazy. If you believe that, you're deceived, okay? That'll break somebody's heart in here this morning. I'm amazed how some people think it's for real. I mean, come on. But tag team wrestling, you know, you, you see these guys and they're in there, they're getting thumped and pummeled and somebody's jumping on them and doing all sorts of stuff. And then they, in their last breath, you know, they're about to sort of, Leave the planet. And they reach out and they, they reach out and their mate's on the other side of the ropes and he reaches out and their fingers touch and he leaps in and turns the tide and throws the bad guy out of the ring and everybody lives happily ever after. Tag team wrestling partner. See, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. There is stuff going on in our lives. And we're not meant to, try, uh, uh, to, to deal with it all on our own. We carry each other's burdens. Get a tag team wrestling partner. Somebody who will jump into the ring with you when you need some help. Who will fight with you. And you watch what happens. Don't do it on your own. Don't be on your own. If you're saying things like that, Put your hand over your mouth. Hanging, on, hanging in in hard times is about putting your hand over your mouth. It's about not shooting off your mouth and saying things that hurt the heart of God when you're going through difficult times. Job said all these things and some other things that I haven't mentioned this morning. But here's the good news. Clearly God is really ticked off with Job for shooting off the way that he did. Clearly. God is not at all impressed with Job for some of the things he said, some of the things that have hurt the heart of God. And Job says, my ears, this is the good thing. This is the heart of God towards all of us. Job says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you, therefore I repent in dust and ashes. And God forgives Job. And the second part of his life is better than the beginning. The end is always better than the beginning. Amen. Whatever you're going through today, whatever you're going through today, the end 
is better than the beginning. It really is. God is here for you. Just stop saying some of the things that you've been saying and reach out your hand in the heart of this loving, gracious Father God will reach out and take your hand and you'll be able to walk together. Maybe you should have put your hand over your mouth on a couple of occasions. Maybe you should have done that. Well, you can repent. You can say, I'm sorry for hurting you, God, and reach out to him this morning. You know, in just a minute or two that we've got left, I'm going to ask uh, anybody who feels that, you know, they, they've made these kind of statements and perhaps is realising for the first time how that is actually restricting their walk with God creating a division between them and God. And you just want to sort of put it behind you and get the right perspective on things. Uh, if that's you this morning, would you just stand? I want to pray for you. Now, there's no shame in this because, you know, pretty well all of us could be standing. Seriously. Seriously, we could. Now, you know, I want you to receive something from the Lord right now. You know, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to lives, don't we? This is a Holy Spirit-filled church. We believe that God can just reach in, reach into our innermost being and touch us in places where no surgeon can ever touch us and just change things. And I want to say this to you this morning, that uh, in a moment as you have the opportunity to just repent of the things that you've said, I want you to know this, that God will reach in and you'll feel a healing take place that immediately launches you into closer relationship with God. Immediately. Immediately. So, Father, I pray for every man and woman, young person standing. Oh, God, I thank you for their openness of heart this morning. I thank you for their willingness to stand and confess before a whole congregation that they've said things they should never have said, things that have hurt you. And this morning, Lord, as they confess that and repent of it, I pray that you will come into their lives right now in the name of Jesus and touch them and minister life and minister life. In Jesus' name. Just receive it now. Receive it now. Receive it now. Receive it now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God is good all the time, isn't he? God bless you, everyone. You can take your seats again. Thank you, Pastor Peter. I appreciate very much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. That was really uh, good. You were a good congregation. I can pick the difference between somebody who's just putting up with what you're saying and somebody who's listening. And, uh, you know, God will bless you. you. You've done well. You've got a good church, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Awesome. Thank you.